you know, if you try to think back through the past week, you can find a lot of really weird, weird things in our culture and uh, things that are going on. Did you read the article? Most of you probably did. Um, and one of the papers, the Worcester paper this week, where it talked about the, um, the, the organization from Akron that set up in Ripman because they were um, doing the ghost hunting. Uh, there's apparently ghosts that appear every year on October 21st in Ripman. And um, there's two different things that apparently happen, and most of you don't even know this happens, but one of them is a train wreck that happened in the 1800s, and they now figured out that that bridge that it crossed was actually outside Ripman here. And so apparently uh, these things, these apparitions happen, and, uh, and I don't believe I even said that word, but they happen, and, um, and some people claim to see that, so they set up. And then there's also the one of the Indian woman in a canoe that comes down, and she ends up in Charlie's Pond. Now, who, who wouldn't have predicted that? But, um, but she's singing some low, sad song or whatever and warning people. Very, very interesting stuff. <clears throat> then when you look at some of the scandals going on across the area, and <clears throat> I don't know how much um, you paid attention. Uh, for people like me, it was hard not to pay attention to things like uh, what went on at Penn State this last seven or eight days. Um, I grew up in that area, and uh, our high school, we always said, this is true, everybody from our high school either went to Penn State or the State Penn, and so... Um, <laughs> That was true, and uh, now you can see why, probably, but um, <clears throat> just very tragic stuff. But I was so impressed yesterday, I happened to be home, and I thought, I thought Ohio State game might be on. I knew they started at noon, and it was, but <clears throat> when I turned on the TV, I had ESPN on. I had no idea that Penn State's game would be on, and I got to see the teams walking out, the Penn State team walking out, they did a thing where they were like four or five across, and instead of running out of the tunnel, they were arm in arm, and they just walked out, rows of four or five, the entire team. And then um, some of their players ran to the end zone, I guess it was, and went and were shaking hands with fans. By the way, Penn State people, I don't know whether it was coaches, players, or both, um, greeted the Nebraska fans as they entered the stadium and welcomed them. I thought that was nice. And then they, um, these, so the players went down to the end zone, and most of them, many of them knelt down, prayed, then went and shook hands with fans and stuff. But it, uh, at some point, I was, I was kind of wrapped up in this, and then all of a sudden, uh, the Nebraska team came running out to the middle of the field, which I thought, oh, no, who said something stupid? And I thought it was a fight. I honestly thought a fight was going to start. And, um, and then most of the Penn State team came, and ultimately all of them, and they had a gigantic circle in the middle, and I think it was the team chaplain for Penn State that led him in prayer. Uh, he was very animated. It was not a prayer. It was a sermon. It was, it was, I would have loved to have heard what he was saying, but it looked pretty good. But, you know, with the scandals and, and just the stuff going on, um, I don't know if our world has achieved it or not. I know we've been working hard at it, but I think we've reached a state of imperfection. <laughs> A lot of people are trying to reach the state of perfection, but we are perfecting imperfection, aren't we? And uh, it's really, really kind of sad. I titled this today, uh, this study, and I don't know that I like the word, but I called it Our Destiny. And, um, and I don't really like the word destiny that much, but I think what I'm trying to communicate is that this is the purpose that God has for you and I. That's the purpose of um, what Jesus is communicating in this prayer. Now, it's really unfair to take the greatest prayer that has ever been prayed and to break it up into outlines and sermons. I don't think Jesus prayed in outlines. I think he prayed from his heart, and, uh, and I think it's an incredible, wonderful prayer. But uh, I do want to break it apart and give you verses 17, 18, and 19, and, and share just a little bit here. Jesus, again, is praying this great, unbelievable prayer, and you and I and the disciples are getting to listen in with this. 
when he first started praying this prayer in verses 1 through 5, <clears throat> he mentioned that he had fulfilled everything that the Father wanted him to do. Now, I know in, in reality, in hum, human reality, uh, his going to the cross and raising from the dead was going to happen in the next day and the days to come. But in the mind of God and, and Christ, it was already done. He did everything. And now in this prayer, he's sort of handing off a baton to the disciples and saying, you know, I did everything that God asked me to do. Now it's your turn to minister and, and to serve the kingdom and, and to serve God. And when he did that to the disciples, um, and I really do believe it was for the disciples of Jesus at that time, but we'll see next week that uh, they turned around and handed it to us, and Jesus did too, uh, by including us in, in some of this. So um, the point that this is going to make here is Jesus is going to tell us our destiny is to be different. To be different. You should be sighing a sigh of relief because if you're like me, you're weird. And, and weird is good in the eyes of God. Uh, it may not be good in your peer group or in... Um, and peer pressure kind of things, but weird and different is what God wants us to do. Listen to verses 17, 18, and 19, and I will attempt to read those to you. In the midst of Jesus' prayer, he prayed, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctified myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus is going to give us a, a couple of concepts, but it's all around the idea of sanctified, set apart, different, distinguished. <clears throat> that is the destiny that he has for you and I, is that we would be different. And, um, and that's defined in a lot of different ways. I could come up with lots of definitions for you. In the Old Testament, it seems to be that you're separated from sin and you're devoted wholly to God. Now, in the Old Testament, there's lots of places where it talks about that. It talks about the firstborn being separated and, and dedicated to God. It talks about the tabernacle was something that was separated and dedicated to God. Uh, the temple, Israel itself, God said, you are my chosen people. You are to be separate, different, and dedicated to God, the priest. And, and you can go on and on. There's just lots and lots of things there. In a negative sense, it is separation from evil. We, we stop the evil things that we were doing. We try to put sin away and, and not be, have that be a part of us. In a positive sense, it's, it's dedicated to God. It is wholly for God's use. So when Jesus said he's praying that we would be sanctified, that we would be set apart, that means that he's praying that sin would not rule and reign in my life and in your life anymore, but that I can be taken out of that and placed in a position where what I do, what I think, what I try to accomplish, and the same for you, is dedicated wholly to God. That's a pretty huge requirement and request that Jesus prayed. It probably has to do with position. It has to do with um, position in a sense that we are separated unto God. That doesn't mean that I always do it right or well, but uh, we are called to be some something or someone that is set apart from God and, and set apart from that common use of what we're used to, just common stuff, to be really dedicated to a holy purpose. Everyone who is a believer and follower in Jesus Christ has been sanctified, has been set apart for the purposes of Christ. And if you really struggle with that, and if you say, you know, if you mumble out loud, but you don't know me and, and what I'm like, and, and I'm not that way, I, I struggle with sin. Read Corinthians, because 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul addresses them as believers who are set apart, sanctified, 
uh, for Jesus Christ's sake, but yet so many of them were actually disobedient to God. If you read through that, you see early on in the book of 1 Corinthians that there's a four-way split among the believers. Some saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, and, and, and they're just all split as to uh, where they're going. Some of them were actively suing others and the, and the believers. They, they went outside after a church service and their chariots backed into each other and now they're suing each other and trying to get all they can. And, and, um, and on occasion when they would come to the love feast, like what we'll do next week, when they would come to that, some of them were uh, hoarding food and, and you know, bringing in really good stuff and not letting others participate with them. Some of them were hoarding uh, drink beverages and even getting drunk at these affairs. And there were some of them who lived very immoral lives. And at the very beginning, um, Paul addresses them as sanctified, set apart. They were not practicing their position in Christ. Now, again, that's, that's such a fine line because no one can sit here and say, well, this person's saved and this one's not, and this one is and this one isn't, and I can tell by this or that. Uh, last week we sang the song, um, They Will Know We Are Christians by Our Love, and some of you who were in school when I was back at Grace, we used to uh, change the words of that. We were, Because of the different dress codes and things, we always sang, they know you are Christians by your hair. Uh, for guys, but um, but that's not, you can't do that. We have no way of knowing the heart. God alone knows people's heart. And, uh, and what we can judge is the practice of your life. And what we want to see is not, I don't want to sit here and say, well, this guy's good and this one's bad. What I want to do and what you want to do is look at people's lives and say, wow, they are living for Christ. <laughs> They are doing what is right. Their lives really shout loudly that they are set apart for his service. So that's what the whole idea of sanctified means. It's just to be set apart. So your destiny is to be different, distinct, set apart. Great. If you needed to, you could leave right now. That's the main thing you need to know. But let's look a little bit more at some of these things. Um, <clears throat> that might have been the what, but what, how, how's the how work, the process? In verse 17, he talks about in, sanctified in the truth, and your word is truth. Now, there is such a thing as truth. I enjoyed this. Warren Wearsby, in his commentary, talked about how he was preaching at a church sometime, and someone came up afterwards to him and said, there's no such thing as absolute truth. And he said to them, does that include this statement you just made? <laughs> um, you know, if there's no such thing as absolute truth, that people can tell you that they don't believe in absolute truth. And there will be a lot of people who think that way. I guarantee you they are wrong, and you can, you can prove it to them. You, just, you may need to just talk to them for a little bit, but they believe in truth. They believe in absolutes. Um, a big one happened 10 years ago. People who would say, you know, you have a right to believe or do what you want to do, but they surely didn't say that on September 12, 2001. There was a lot of outcry and people who felt that innocent people being murdered was wrong. Oh, really? I thought there wasn't any truth. How, there's no absolutes. How could that be wrong? Well, most people agreed that things like that were absolutely wrong. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of people... Um, want to believe things, they prefer to believe things that um, maybe help them emotionally to a feel-good position. That's what a lot of people, if you don't have apps, if you don't have truths, particularly based on the Word of God, then a lot of people just will take whatever makes them feel okay at the moment, and that's what they will try to believe. But Jesus said, I want to sanctify them in truth, and in case you don't know what truth is, your word, God, is truth. The word of God, the Bible, is, is God's truth that he has given to us. <clears throat> and there is such a thing as truth. Now, I think I listed in your bulletin, in your outline, 
a phrase that says, our God is a God of truth. <clears throat> I gave you three, four, five verses after that to say things like, God is truth. Um, if we wanted to, if you got a uh, concordance of some kind, you'll probably find 100, 200, maybe 300 more verses that you can easily use. I was just giving you easy stuff there. <clears throat> John in his writings, the Apostle John, here in verse 17, says that the word is truth. Back in John 14, 6, that's a verse you all know. Jesus said, I am the way and the life and the truth, truth, that he is truth. And he's not just true, but he is the truth. And in John, 1 John 5, chapter, uh, verse 7, chapter 5, verse 7, it talks about the spirit of God is the spirit of truth. So we see it in the word, we see it in Christ, we see it in the spirit of God. But it's interesting, John also writes in chapter 8 of his gospel, verse 44, regarding Satan. And he says about Satan, not that he's the truth, but that he is a liar from the beginning, and he is the father of lies. That means he's the one who originated the concept of lying. And lying comes from him. <clears throat> God's word says that we are to be set apart. That we have this destiny to be distinct and different and set apart for the glory of God. John also wrote in his second letter, uh, 2 John in verse 4, where he said, I have no greater joy than to know that my children are walking in the truth. That means they're living a set-apart, sanctified, uh, different, distinct life that is for the honor and service of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> when we yield to the Spirit and we learn from the Word and we love Jesus, that is being sanctified. Well, why would we do that? I mean... Why would somebody want to do that? What would be the motivation to, to cause us to want to live for Jesus? Um, well, he, he did do that so that we would be sent out. Uh, Jesus says that I'm sending them forth. I want them to be separated. They need to be different. People need to look at them and say, I don't understand you. You're different. Why is there a difference in you? And uh, Jesus said, that's why I'm sending you out, is so that you could be distinct and marked out and and uh, people will be drawn to you. There are 16 times in the gospel where it tells us that the Father sent Jesus out uh, on a mission for the kingdom, and now he's turning around and sending us. Um, <clears throat> the word sent means um, it usually has to do with an appointment. It's like, I am specifically appointing you for this task, there's a job, I'm, I'm giving you a job, and it includes the idea of equipping you for it. It's one thing to say to somebody, you know, I got a job for you to do, go do it. And it's another thing to say, but I'm gonna give you the tools to do that particular job. We could tell children, we want you to uh, play baseball, go outside and play baseball. And they'll say, that's great, but I don't have a bat and I don't have a ball. I don't care, just, but it's not that way. We give them the bat, we give them the ball. And that's what the word sent, in a technical sense, seems to be communicating. When Jesus is sending us forth, he's giving us the tools and the resources to be able to accomplish what he wants us to do. We're set apart from the world so that we can go into the world and rescue lost sinners and get them out of the world, <laughs> or at least get the world out of them. I just finished reading a really, really great book. Some of you know I've mentioned it before. It's, um, it's about 9-11, 10 years ago, and it was written by a New York City police officer who was involved there, and he tells unbelievable graphic details of every minute of what happened during those attacks. And one of the things that impresses me with the first responders, their job was to go in to the danger and to bring people out. That was their job. 
And at the very beginning, when the, when the planes hit the buildings and workers and visitors in the buildings were aware that something's happening, uh, there were hundreds and thousands of people running away from the buildings. But time and time again, this guy would describe a unit of six policemen or maybe 15 firemen who were running against a crowd to go in. Everybody else is running out. They're running in. And the thing that really impressed me was even with the incredible danger that obviously was there, you know, maybe you could be bold for a minute and run in and grab somebody and pull them out, but these guys and dolls kept going back and back and back, in and out, in and out, and many of them, several, several of them ended up losing their lives as a result of that. And that's sort of the kind of thing that Christ is challenging you and I to do, to run into the danger of the world, which is a dangerous world. It's a scandalous world. It's a spooky-filled world that we're to run into and rescue people and get them out and run back in and rescue people and get them out and run back in. And if it's the cause of our demise, that's still a very, very good cause. We're set apart to be holy, separated from sin, and devoted to God. Some people isolate themselves. They think, well, I'm to be separated, so I don't want to visit with you or that. Or, and some uh, believers take that really to extremes. Now, hundreds of years ago, you had your monks who would go out and they'd sit on high pillars or they'd go out in the deserted areas and they just felt that that helped them to have a holy life. And maybe it did, maybe it did, but it didn't help them to rescue anybody. They were not able to interact with people. And there are groups today that will call themselves separatists and, and that's an okay thing if you're separating from sin but now let's be devoted to a holy cause and get back in and, and fight the battle for Christ. True sanctification, I believe, is balanced. That we're set apart by God so that we can be sent out by God to reach other people. We're not anti-world. We want to live for him. And our motive for sanctification is service. That's what he's calling us out. He's not calling us out so that we can form a little holy club that just kind of hangs around each other and, and doesn't impact anything else, but he's called us to serve a lost world. If you're not serving others, I'm not sure that you can truly be considered sanctified. <clears throat> and by the way, in, in the text here, in verse 18, it's in the past tense, so it's anticipated action. It's sort of like, this is going to happen, but it's as good as done. Uh, the command was already given, and the messengers are sent out. A little bit later, when Jesus raises from the dead in John chapter 20, uh, when he appears back into the room where some of his disciples are, he, of course, speaks peace to them, and then he says, as my Father has sent me, I also send you. So even though now he's praying for that, later on he's going to officially commission them and tell them that's what they need to do. Well, he helps us too by being the model for what we, what we are to be. <clears throat> We're to be to the world a manifestation of a new character. And the character is one of Jesus Christ. That's what we're being separated to do. When we want to be holy, then we're being holy in the image of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the perfect model for you and I. He's the perfect model of a servant. I'm not going to take time, but Philippians chapter 2, where it talks about how he emptied himself. Um, it's, we're told to have this attitude in us, verse 5, Philippians 2. We should have this attitude that Jesus had, that even though he was God, he emptied himself and came to earth to serve and to do what God has um, ordained to do. Jesus did not cut himself off from the world, <clears throat> nor was he assimilated into it. <laughs> uh, that's happening a lot today. A lot of Christians are saying, oh, we got to be like the world. we got to be so much like the world that we look like them and do all the things they do. 
And I'm not so sure he wants us to do that either. Jesus accepted his place where God called him to be distinct and different. And that included pain and everything else. Uh, but he still did that. This new character, the character of Christ in you, you being separated from sin and devoted to a holy cause, I believe is the greatest need in the world today. The world economy, you know, what's it going to do? Who knows? Who cares? <laughs> It's not that critical. Well, everything could crash and people, I know, people can be hurt. We can be hurt. That's fine. Or, you know, wars and, and uh, diseases. All these things are horrible, horrible things. What the world needs more than anything else today is not a banking system, not military peace, not even cures of horrible diseases. What they need is you to be set apart sanctified for Jesus Christ, set apart from sin, and living a devoted life for God. That is what this world needs more than anything else. True sanctification makes you and me different from the world. And the difference is what enables you and I to minister to the world. Too many people want to blend in and imitate the world. There's no distinction, no uniqueness to them. That makes it really hard to do the First Peter 3.15 thing, where Peter said that we should be different so that the people in the world would ask us about that difference, and we should be ready to give an explanation as to the hope that is within us, that we have in our hearts. So your destiny, my destiny, is one of sanctification. The what is to be sanctified the how is by the truth of his word, and the why is to become useful. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's the very simple idea of what Jesus is praying for us here. When it comes to Jesus Christ, and we want to imitate him, we want to be like him, we need to do more than just admire him. We worship him for who he is. And in worshiping him, we can become more like him. <clears throat> As you and I move out in mission, we can know that Christ, our high priest, has prayed for us. He really has. He prayed that we could do this and do it well. And if you understand Matthew 28, verse 20, it says, Yea, and lo, I go with you even always, even to the ends of the age. So as I go out and I serve Christ and I try to be a separated believer, he is praying that I can do this, that I can stand firm, that I can honor him. And he goes with us in a very, very unique and powerful way. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for the call that you've given to us to be separated to the cause and the glory of Jesus Christ. Lord, you know that every one of us are weak and we're just not able to... Uh, to achieve high and lofty things. But I think you also know that that's not what you called us to do. You called us to be ourselves and to live for you. And Lord, I think that's the desire of so many of them here. And Lord, I pray that you would empower us, first of all, to know you, just to know our Savior, Jesus, to have the peace that comes only from the forgiveness of sins that Jesus has granted. And then to, um, to worship and fellowship with you and to walk with you, to walk in your truth and to grow day after day more and more like Jesus. God, just um, bring honor to yourself by helping us to become more like Jesus Christ. The need is so great in our world and we want to be part of that solution. Help us to live for you to live like you, and to bring glory to your name. We ask it in Christ. Amen.